All righty, good morning. Um, you, you should be able to find a, a, a seat pretty easy this morning. Uh, most of our youth are next door working. Um, we're having a uh, luncheon right after church that you are invited to. Um, we have plenty of, of food over there for everybody. It is lasagna. Um, and we, just, we have a ton of stuff happening today. You can get your car washed. You can throw a water balloon at Marissa. Oh, I'm sorry, at Brother Tom. You can throw water balloons at Brother Tom. Um, you can do all types of stuff today. You can even, you can even uh, buy a youth and take them home for the rest of their lives. Um, we're going to be auctioning those off as well. So we're excited. But this morning, I have a young man who's going to come stand by me. He's a little bit nervous, but he's doing good. Dad may come with him. Come on, little buddy. We got this right here. I'm going to be right by you. <clears throat> he is going to share with us. He's discussing it right now with his mom and dad. But he's going to sing a song this morning. Ready, set, and... Hey, J.D., do you want to sit in that chair and do it? You want to sit in the chair and do it so you have to see all these faces? They scare me too sometimes. We were all ready to go 30 seconds ago. Now life has happened. J.D., how about this? Let them sing with you. You want that to happen? No, he wants to do it by himself, he said. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to give him a moment to warm up while they sing their very first song. We're just going to punt this morning. We're going to make this happen. Y'all stand sing with me. This world is not my home, I'm just a present thing. My treasures are laid up, so we're beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven to window, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, I know I have to feel like you. If heaven's not my home, oh, He's not feeling well. He's, so pray for Noe, and he'll, he'll, be, he'll be just fine, I know. We just pray for his comfort and healing. All right. We also have, I think, some VBS songs. Is that correct? Are we doing VBS songs? So while we're still waiting on, you ready? Come on, bud. We got you. If you say you're ready, we're going to give it a shot. If not, we're going to go on with VBS songs. Go ahead and cut the mic on. I think we're ready. Hit it.
He's trying to convince his mother. Wretch. We'll see if he'll be ready here in a minute. <clears throat> so we're going to go ahead. Y'all should have, I'm telling you, those of us that were here the other night, we got to hear him, and it was awesome. It really was. It was awesome. So it was really, really good. Y'all didn't get to hear him, so why are you applauding? Um, <laughs> we want VBS to come up then at this time, if VBS is ready to do their songs. By the way, we have decided that uh, we're going to keep all these decorations up permanently. It's just easier this way. And uh, Christmas in Australia, you know, Easter in Australia. Tree. Wombat, numbat, cricket bat, red back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lorikeet, kookaburra, ha ha, brain coral living in the sea. Flying fox, there's a croc, clownfish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a wombat. What a great god, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a dingo. Oh, yeah. You know, we ain't. 
ain't just talking about another branch on the family tree. We're talking about a different tree. Uh, we're talking about trees? Thought we are talking about animals. Uh, animal trees? Just sing the song, mate. A bit faster this time. There's a kangaroo, platypus, dingo, emu, koala up a tree. Wombat, numbat, cricket bat, red back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lorikeet, kookaburra, ha ha, brain coral living in the sea. Blind fox, there's a croc, clownfish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a wombat. What a great god, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a dingo. Oh yeah. We're made different. For example, have you ever heard a camel try and sing? No, but birds can sing. Fair point. Very repetitive lyrics, though. Let's try it faster. There's a kangaroo, platypus, dingo, emu, koala up a tree. Wombat, numbat, cricket bat, red back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lorikeet, kookaburra, ha ha, brain coral living in the sea. Blind fox, there's a croc, clownfish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to give a quick update. For those of y'all that did not know, we had 108 kids signed up for VBS this week, 108. And then we had over 50 volunteers. And if the song is stuck in your head, so sorry, Eric. We had the kids vote by participation during opening and closing ceremony, and those were the two songs that they chose. So thank y'all. It was, uh, honestly, it was a great week. Uh, we had a fantastic time. I want to personally thank Marissa for all the hard work that she put in. Um, I would also like to ask all of you who worked VBS, teenagers, adults, if you're in here, would you please stand if you worked VBS? Very, very good. Thank you so much. We do appreciate that uh, absolutely unbelievable time that we've had. Um, I would tell you that we learned a lot. Uh, basically, we are different than a wombat. We did learn that, as you heard from that song. Um, everything was made for a purpose, with a purpose. Um, so the kids really were challenged this week to know why they are here, that they are wonderfully made. Uh, in the image of God. And what does that mean? Not, not our physical body, because we know God is not held in the physical body, but the attributes, the things that he gave us uh, to be, those are the things that are like God. And so we are so thankful that we were made in his image. I want to real quickly tell you about a, a baby shower that is coming up. And that baby shower uh, is for Taylor Guzman. And uh, Taylor is due in September the... 13th. <laughs> Papa knows. Oh, it's your birthday. There you go. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So September the 13th is when she's due. Um, she and I are in a contest to see who can get the biggest, the fastest. And um, I was informed that she gets to get rid of hers. Uh, so, but uh, we want to definitely remember them. With that baby shower, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. Ladies, we would love for you to be a part of that. The ladies of the church, uh, the women's ministry are putting that on for her. And so that'll be at uh, the, uh, July the 30th at 11 a.m. So that is a Saturday morning at 11 a.m. over in the fellowship hall. And so you can RSVP online or in the church foyer. So those are the things that I had uh, to go for. And Tyler, where are you at, sir? There you go, bud. It does. Um, in case you are wondering about his hair, uh, there's a bunch of cans in the back back there. I and got if, a total too. if the kids got to a certain amount, he had to do this to his hair. 
Now, here's the difference. It was supposed to be pink, right? And this is after bleach. And, and so it was supposed to be pink, but it turned out whatever, this is. whatever that is. Yeah. So I'm, You're I'm, next. I'm going to go now. So that number was 500 cans, and the latest update I now have is they raised 1,972 cans. Next year will be a higher number. Next year, I'm starting the bidding at 3,000 cans. <laughs> uh, just a few more announcements. I lost the announcements paper, so if I miss anything, someone just yell at me and tell me I'm fired. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right. Uh, Wednesday night is back, correct, Tom? This week. Wednesday night is back, so we'll have our dinner at 6.15, Bible study at 7.00. Uh, our teenagers will be at youth camp, but for everybody else, uh, be there for that. Um, can anyone tell me, Donna, what y'all are making? Anybody? What? Sloppy Joes. Bring your bibs. All right. Uh, Thursday morning, uh, Toddle will be starting a new book of the Bible in his prime timers Bible study, so let's give him a hand for that. Uh, his choice, uh, I am questioning. But they finish Exodus, and this week they will start Leviticus chapter 1. So in about five more years, we can say he's finished that one too. Uh, and finally, uh, right after service, our youth are doing a fundraiser to raise uh, money for camp and also money just for uh, general operating costs uh, for the calendar year. We are doing a uh, lasagna meal, a car wash, a dessert auction, as well as auctioning off some other things. And you can buy a water balloon for a dollar and throw it at Tom. Uh, we have 3,000 water balloons ready for you. So. At least my hair is not maroon. We'll see. I can handle water balloons. All right. Yes, I can. Did I miss anything? Uh, one thing. My wife wants to come up and make a quick... Uh, Prayer request. Uh, by the way, Donna Colbeck uh, just sent us a note that she'll be getting out of the hospital today. Um, she has been uh, in the hospital for most of the week uh, at College Station. And uh, so just continue to lift her up, um, if you would. But uh, they, she is going to get out this morning, so we praise the Lord for that. My wife has some stuff that she wants to share. If you would, just please pray for this family she's about to tell you about. Hi, I come with some sad news this morning. Um, I am asking for you to pray for the Jacks family. Um, it is a teacher at Rose Hill, and um, their baby, uh, she had a baby two months ago. Where's Lauren? Two months ago, and um, the baby died in its sleep um, the night before last. So just a very traumatizing. Um, uh, we're just heartbroken for them, and um, they do have another little girl named Lincoln, but just a very sad time. Um, Robert Smith, where are you? Will you pray for them?
you father in all the things that happen and that that can happen and everything lord we trust you we need you and we love you we we have nothing and we are nothing apart from you father no good thing in me other than you lord so the time comes lord please guard his heart and his mind father please speak to us and teach us we need to hear from you. We love you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. He's going to get brave enough one of these days, and it's going to be over when he does. Let me tell you what he said to his parents, that he wants to be what Doug is, that he wants to lead music. And uh, so you pray that God will continue that call upon his precious little heart. Because when God grabs the attention of our children, we pray that they will continue in that call the rest of their life. So often... When our kids start telling us things, we try to push it off thinking, well, they're not ready, they're too young, they're this, they're that. And and the truth is, when God calls upon us, we've got to be paying attention. Even if if our children are are young, we don't push it away. We talk very honestly and openly about their need for salvation and the call that God puts on our lives. So I appreciate so much the prayers for our children. Um, Out of those hundred and some odd that we had, 108, I'm telling you, the majority of those came right here from this church. What an awesome thing to know that. And uh, God has blessed us beyond measure, really has. Um, This morning, I want us to talk about, as we learned this morning in in Sunday school, uh, to pray for your pastor. First of all, let me just share this with you. There are days that... uh, a pastor begins to question the effectiveness of his ministry, whether or not the impact is is positive. Some days he questions, can he do the job that God has called him to do? There are days that, as as your pastor here at Pine Island, that I that I have just really just sat in, in awe and wonder of how we got to where we are now. So I covet the prayers of the people that God has called me to shepherd. And I covet the prayers of each one of you as you pray for myself, as you pray for my wife and my family. There have been a lot of challenges that have happened here at Pine Island over the years. We've seen a lot of changes, a lot of crazy things take place. There have been moments where we saw God move in such a way that you just sat and went, wow. We've watched victory after victory. We have seen battle after battle. And yet the faithful prayers of the many. 
You've heard me share this many times, and I, and I will share it today because it's so important. Every day I wake up, I wake up with this confidence. Without a shadow of a doubt, I wake up knowing this, that I have been prayed for that I have been lifted up as a pastor, that I have been lifted up by this church. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has heard the, the prayers and the cries of, the, of, of his people here at Pine Island on behalf of their pastor, and I, I greatly appreciate that. So I want to share a little bit about why I need those prayers this morning and, and, and what the job is, what all it entails I will, I will give you a, a day in my life that happened a number of years ago here at Pine Island. I was awakened by a phone call uh, in the early morning hours. And the call was that a father had had a massive heart attack and had been life flighted uh, to College Station at St. Joseph's. And I got up that morning and I headed to St. Joseph's. And while I was there, I got another phone call that there had been a car accident and that those people had been taken to the Woodlands. I left the College Station Hospital once I uh, had prayed with the family and stayed with them for a little while and I drove then to the Woodlands. And I sat with that family as the struggle of what would happen with their loved one after the wreck, what would happen, what would take place. I then got another phone call that took me to the medical center down in Houston. I left the Woodlands and drove into Houston, and from Houston I got the news that they did not expect the gentleman in College Station to make it. So I turned around and I left and went to College Station again. I could not have done those things without, first of all, a family that supports me, a wife who understands the call of ministry, a daughter who understands that dad's not going to always be there. There are many things that my family missed, vacations that were paid for that we missed because we had to be here for this church. I do not regret having to miss those because our church family needed us. I'm not the greatest preacher in the world, and I know that. And I don't say that so you'll walk out afterwards and say, no, Brother Tom, you're a great preacher. No, no, no. Listen, I know there are people in this church right here who can preach circles around me. I've sat and listened to them. God has given me the heart of a pastor, and I love this church. And I love the people in this church. I want to be there when you hurt. I want to be there when you celebrate. I want to be a part of your life every step of the way because that's the heart of a pastor. That's what God has given me to stand with you, to stand beside you, to try and protect, to try to lead. And so I'm very thankful that today I can tell you that I have a wife and a daughter and a son-in-law who I know love me and stand by me, and for that I'm very thankful. And I have a church who does the same. They stand by me. They stand with me. Not every day is like the one I just described, but they do happen. One thing I've learned over the years, a lot of you know this to be true, deaths happen in what? In threes. Isn't that weird? But it does. It is the strangest thing you've ever seen. Somebody will call and say, well, so-and-so passed, and I guarantee you within a week you have two more that have gone. Strange how that happens. But in ministry, you learn the, the parts of life that other people don't know about. You know the hurts and the pains that others don't know about. You watch families grieve over the loss of a child. You see families grieve over the loss of a matriarch and a patriarch. You see families grieve over divorce. You see families grieve over things that, that no, nobody understands, the diagnosis of cancer and the fear that comes over people. 
There's a lot of responsibilities that your pastor holds and carries. So praying for your pastor is very important. And I'm thankful for, again, this church who I know prays for me. There are times in my life where I have kind of had a rough go and this thought has come into my mind. And I I don't want to embarrass her this morning, but I'm going to say this. It shouldn't embarrass her. Instead, you all uh, should should celebrate the fact that we have such a wonderful person in this church. But as I'm going through that rough time, God will put an impress upon my heart. Don't forget Irene Cooper is praying for you right now. I tell you, there have been moments in my life, honestly, where God just let me know that at that very moment, she was praying for me. And I want to have given her a call, and we'll just talk. Folks, I am blessed beyond measure, and I know that. But there's a lot of things that I have to carry that I don't always carry well. There are burdens, there are those secrets that you cannot share. There are those things that when you're sitting in a chair and someone gives you uh, news in their life, you have to sit there and act as though you're not shocked. You have to sit there and just take whatever they're giving you and just continue to listen. And, And most of you that know me, you know that one thing I struggle with, and that is slow to speak and quick to hear. Um, pray for your pastor to be able to listen and to get the whole story. There are certain parts of my ministry that I know I'm very weak in. Pray for God to strengthen those parts of the ministry. Do you realize that in November, it will be 19 years that we have been at this church? Can, you, can I tell you what, what a blessing that is? I am so thankful that for 19 years, God has given us a place to call home. He has given us a place to call family. This is is our home. This is our family. These are the people that we know. Someone told me, Brother Tom, if we keep growing, we're not going to be the church we used to be. Let me, let me share this with you. Folks, if we keep growing, we just got to keep loving. And you got to keep being faithful and keep sharing the gospel and keep straight to the word of God and, and, and don't go left or right and understand that if we're growing, it's because God is growing us. Embrace that. Embrace the fact that things are different. I love the fact that I'm sitting here in the middle of July and there's a lot of seats that are filled. God has blessed us. It's amazing to to think about all the things that that are happening. So yes, I am blessed beyond measure to be your pastor. So if you have your Bible, turn to Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 11 through 15. Let's stand together as we read from God's word. Now at this point, Uh, Israel is being brought back to the Lord by God's own hand. Um, Anytime you say that you decided to come back to God, be very careful with that because you wouldn't know you needed to come back to God unless the Lord revealed that to you. Israel has been brought back by the hand of God, and he is about to tell them that he's going to give them a shepherd, one to teach them and help them. So he says, and the Lord said to me, faithless Israel has proved herself to be more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look at you in anger, for I am gracious, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your wrongdoing, that you have revolted against the Lord your God and have scattered your favors to the strangers under every leafy tree. And you have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. Return, you faithless sons, declares the Lord, for I am a master to you. And I will take you one from a city and two from a family and bring you to Zion. Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you knowledge and understanding. Father, may I understand this morning as pastor 
that my job is to feed knowledge and understanding to this flock. God, that I am to take and to look into your word and to understand it myself and then proclaim it before your people, not as my opinion, but God, as your truth. So, Father, may I never get those two confused. May I always know your truth and declare it from this pulpit. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So as you pray for me, pray that I can carry out the two things that are mentioned here. To feed you knowledge and understanding, a biblical worldview. If you were to look at the world today, you would see uh, that the world says that we evolved. And if you evolved, there's no creator, then there is no right and wrong because even that evolves. Which, by the way, if you're wondering why the world has changed so much, it is because they don't believe in a creator. Therefore, things can change generation to generation. But for the church, nothing should change that is preached from the pulpit. What was declared in the day of Christ should also be declared in our day here in 2022. What was declared in the garden when God created man should still be taught as absolute truth right here in 2022. We are to be people who share uh, and preach knowledge and understanding and absolute truth. And we're to do this in love without apology. This is a big thing now. A lot of pastors won't preach on certain subjects because, well, it might offend someone. Folks, if you are offended or if you walk out saying, well, Brother Tom's been using us as examples... Can I tell you something? You might want to talk to God about that, not Brother Tom. We are to preach truth in love without apology because the truth does not need an apology. The truth is the truth. And if we declare the truth to you, we declare it as the word of God, not as my opinion. Listen, there are things that God's word says. Listen, We all struggle with them, including the preacher. But that doesn't change the fact that God said this is how it is. We have to be faithful to what God has called us to preach. We have to be faithful to to do what God has called us to do, to live how he called us to live. Now, what I have found at times, we will take God's word and we will either make it so hard for people to follow that nobody can come to Christ And I have been in churches like that where the pastor basically told everybody, you are so beyond redemption that there's no hope, which, by the way, is not true. Aren't you thankful for that? If you hear my voice this morning and you're looking for a God who forgives, what did he say up there? You tell him that the Lord will no longer look at you in anger, for I am gracious, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your wrongdoing. Church, one of the greatest things of knowledge is this. If you truly want repentance, you got to admit you need it. You ever heard somebody try to say they were sorry, but then give seven reasons why they did what they did? That's not real apology. That is a person who knows that you want to hear a certain thing, so they say it, but then they make themselves justified. There's only one who can justify you, and that is God. We have to own up, admit, confess that we have a problem. Folks, if you want to understand this, he is saying only acknowledge your wrongdoing, that you have revolted against the Lord your God and have scattered your favors to the strangers under every leafy tree, and you have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. Can I tell you something? That sounds like us, doesn't it? That sounds like the church in America. That sounds like a whole lot of people that that, uh, are, are... saying that they're believers, but yet they live as though they don't trust any of God's word, it's time for us to say, God, I have wronged people. I have done wrong, and then make no excuse. Just own it. Just own it. And the very God who forgave his own people will be the very God that will forgive you and bring you into his family. We are to preach Truth in love without apology. We're to give the biblical worldview from the pulpit. The biblical worldview. That means that we look at the world through the lens of Scripture. If your child is in public school, 
listen, you must have that child come home. You must discuss what was talked about during the day so that you can give them the biblical worldview along with what they've learned in public school. Because what they're learning in public school does not at all follow what we are teaching here in the pulpit. It's a sad truth, but it is still the truth. That is why I appreciate those who are in the public school who teach, who are believers, because they do everything they can to make sure that the truth is also shared from their classroom. They take a risk by sharing the truth in their classroom. They could lose their job, but because they're believers and they feel called to the public school, that is where their battle is, and they choose that. So I applaud and appreciate every single one of you who teach in the public school because you have agreed to take on the challenge while presenting the gospel. But if your child is there, listen, they're hearing things that are not true and correct. They need a biblical world view. Salvation, biblical worldview, the gospel, there's only one way to be saved. Only one. And that is in Jesus Christ. Even the men and women of the Old Testament were saved through Christ. You say, well, Jesus wasn't even born yet. Folks, quit thinking that Jesus only existed when he was incarnate here upon the earth. Jesus has always been. The Bible says that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The gospel, biblical worldview, salvation, Christ alone. Then family. The family unit. The world says, well, the family unit is whatever you make it. We no longer have mothers and fathers. Now we have birthing people. You are what your birth certificate says you are, regardless of what you desire to be different. God created you, fashioned you all in the womb, and made you the way you are. Family, marriage, father, mother, children. These are things that the world does no longer hold up high. They're not held in high esteem, but the church, we celebrate family and marriage and fathers and mothers and children. church. Oh, here's the one. The men. You may tell you why so many women are leading because so many men quit. We look down upon women who are thrust into certain roles. The reason they were thrust into those roles is because the man quit doing his job. Men are to be leaders. Doesn't make it right that she's there, but where's the man? God called the man, the biblical worldview is that the men should be leading the church, leading the family. It's my job to share these things, to let you know, and there are people in this world today who hate the truth, and eventually the preaching from this pulpit and other pulpits who preach truth, it'll be considered hate speech, so pray for your pastor. Pray for your pastor. We're called to shepherd. We're called to shepherd. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11 says, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility consider one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Death on the cross. 
And for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. As a shepherd, you are trying to keep the sheep together. You are desiring that they come and they become one unit and they feed together, they, they move together, they recognize the shepherd's voice, they recognize all the leading of the shepherd and, and how he's trying to take them to greener pastures. And, and sometimes to get to greener pastures, you got to go over some tough terrain. And as that terrain gets tough, you want a pastor who is going to empty himself into his sheep. He's going to do everything that he can to protect his sheep. He will set the example of what service looks like, of what love looks like, of what help looks like, of what hurt hurting with someone looks like, of what celebrating with someone looks like. That's the job of the pastor. And so many people today, and I don't understand this, so many people say, I want to be in ministry and I want to pastor a church, but I don't actually want to be a part of the people. It doesn't work. The heart of the shepherd looks at Christ, who is the greatest shepherd, who emptied himself. And that's the same call that you and I have been given, those who are in ministry, to empty yourself, to give of yourself, so that the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and that every tongue will confess. I watch our youth. And in our minds, we're always thinking, boy, that'd be a really, that the kid, that's a good kid right there. You know what I watch for, watch for in our youth? I watch for those kids that are willing to go the extra mile. I watch for those kids who are willing to do things that nobody else is willing to do. They don't have to be told to go and do this and go and do that. The heart of a pastor can be seen even in other people who aren't necessarily called to to ministry, but they have a heart of compassion. They have a heart of service. And and as a pastor, you should have all of those same things that, that you desire to serve and desire to give and to pour yourself out. That's the heart of a shepherd of a pastor. You pray that I am willing to pour myself out. You pray that I am willing to give of myself that I'm willing to walk through the dark days, that I'm willing to come alongside and speak truth even when no one else wants to hear it, even when God's word is no longer popular, may I pour myself out by continuing to preach the truth of the scripture. But I want you to look at this. Part of our job is to protect to protect. Now, a lot of us don't want to be protected <laughs> until we're so bad off. Then all of a sudden we want protection. Sometimes the warning of the pastor goes ignored. Sometimes the warning of the, of the preacher goes ignored and, and we don't hear it, we don't listen to it, and, and then we're finally in trouble and then we, we yell out, kind of like Peter did after he started walking on the water and he got to looking at the waves, he began to sink and the first thing he did was he just yelled out and, and held his hand out to Christ. But folks, the pastor's job is to be a protector. You might not always like what the preacher preaches, but if he's preaching from the Bible, don't get mad at the preacher. He's just declaring the word of truth. I want you to listen to Psalm 23, verse 4. Many of you know it. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. God's given us this rod and this staff, and I want to read this to you. Most frequently, the staff is used in three ways, shepherd's staff. The first is drawing sheep together into an intimate relationship. This is of special interest during lambing season because in a large flock, there are often dozens or scores of lambs being born at the same time. And it's easy for the ewe to lose her lamb in all of the confusion. 
The shepherd has to make sure the right lamb gets with the right you. For those who have just a few sheep, that would be no problem. But when there are hundreds and sometimes thousands of ewes in one flock, the staff becomes very important. As much as he is able, the shepherd watches the lambs being born. Then if there is any confusion at all between the lamb and the ewe, he uses his staff to hook the lamb around the neck through the body, picks the lamb up by his staff, and carries it to the proper ewe. He cannot touch the lamb. If he touches the lamb, the ewe will not, be, will not suckle it because there is a wrong odor, the smell of a man. And that you fears uh, the smell too much. It will not feed its own lamb. These are the lambs one may see people feeding with a bottle. The staff then is used to bring the lamb into an intimate relationship with its you. Part of the preaching of the sermon is to bring you into an intimate relationship with your master, with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and so when a, a pastor begins to see someone wandering off, their job is to come and share the truth with that person in love without apology, to get them back in the right relationship with the one that they need. Secondly, the staff is used to reach out and grab a lamb for close inspection. Sometimes I will take some folks out that I know that are struggling and we'll just go to lunch. Because there are days that I just need to know how you're doing. One of the things I've noticed as our church has grown, this becomes of greater need. Uh, there's more time spent out of the office learning about people, learning about their life, and watching some of our young adults right now. I'm going to tell you, you want to pray for some folks, you pray for our young adults. There are so many things happening in their lives, so much stuff going on within our young adults. Pray for them. Pray for them. God is doing a work amongst the, within the hearts of the men in our church, and it's a beautiful thing to see, but a lot of them look at me like I've never felt this way before. I've never experienced this before. They want to sit and, and talk with the pastor, and it blesses my heart. So that close inspection is there, and this way it frequently precedes the passing under the rod, the shepherd, shepherd's hook by the neck or leg and leads it to where he will examine it. Thirdly, the staff is used in guiding the sheep as they are moving along because sheep tend to wander off. Can I tell you that as a pastor, I've watched a lot of sheep wander off. And if the, if the pastor, if the shepherd lets the sheep wander off too far, one of two things often happens. One, that sheep never returns to the fold. Or, and shame on the other sheep, but sometimes the other sheep say, well, they've been gone so long, we don't want them back. Did you catch what I just said? It's sad, but true. Sad, but true. They always think that the pasture is greener somewhere else. And they start to wander away. The whole flock will be going one way, but there will be one that heads in her own direction. The shepherd will frequently use the blunt end to jab the sheep in the ribs and nudge it back in the direction of the flock. So the next time that I see somebody going in their own direction, I'm just supposed to hit you to grab your attention. I think sometimes it'd be better just to knock some of you in the head and get you going the other direction, but that's the gentleness that I'm supposed to have and as a pastor. The staff represents God's spirit. It indicates gentle guidance, whereas the rod suggests sterner measures such as offenses or defenses, protection. God leads, guides by his spirit. John 16, 13, where Jesus told his disciples that he would not leave them to fend for themselves, but he would provide another guide. 
However, when it, the spirit of truth has come, it will guide you into all truth, for it will not speak on its own authority, but whatever it hears, it will speak, and it will tell you things to come. John Rittenball wrote all this that I just read to you this morning, and I thought it was pretty powerful how he put that. Pray for me because, folks, I don't want to use the staff wrong. Pray for me because some people I have found out in ministry, and this is going to shock some of you, but some people you will never make happy. Some of you are married to those people. If you didn't laugh, it's probably you. There's just going to be some people in church you're never going to make happy. But you know what I found out a long time ago? My job's not to make you happy. My job is to walk according to what God has given me to do. So you want to help your pastor out? Can I tell you how to do it real quick before we close? You can help your pastor out in this way. Love the word of God. So that when I preach it here, you can go amen and affirm what I'm saying. Instead of ouch, you can amen it because you already knew it. The other thing you can do is you can love one another because one of the most beautiful pictures is when all the lambs and all the sheep are together in one fold and they're all headed in the right direction, amen? But here's my closing, and I want you to listen. Acts 20, 28 says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I am here to protect what God has entrusted me with. 2 Timothy 4, 2 says, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, correct rebuke and exhort with great patience and instruction. I am to preach even when nobody wants to hear it. James 3, 1, do not become teachers in large numbers, my brother, since you know that we who are teachers will incur a stricter judgment. Pray for your pastor that he can learn when and what and where and how to say the right thing and to do the right thing. Because while you'll be judged, I'll be judged even greater. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account, so that they may do this with joy, not groaning, for this would be unhelpful for you. Listen, if you don't like something that I do or say, don't go tell anybody else. Have the courage to come and talk to me face to face. Have the courage to come and speak to me. Because that's important. You'd be surprised at how many people chicken out and go and try to tell my wife. Seriously. They'll go to her and tell her, you know, hey, would you, you know what I'm saying? It happens. Finally, Romans 1.16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, for to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You pray that I will run wholeheartedly with the gospel. And you pray that I will embrace it and love it and teach it and proclaim it wherever I am. And church, let me tell you this morning, I love you. And I am thankful for all that God has done in these 19 years. Many of you know there were 33 people that first Sunday. And we have watched God do things that will just amaze you. Out of those 33 people, there's just a handful that are left that were here that first Sunday. Seven or eight. But we as a family have grown so close to those seven or eight over the years. And we're so thankful for those who have been here. 
those of you that came just a year or two later, you've been with us for so long and we've trusted you as family. And those of you that are here today for the first time, maybe in a long time, don't let this be the last time you come. Commit yourself to your local church. We don't advertise ourselves as being a perfect church because that's going to only happen when we're with the Lord in heaven. But we are a church that strives to love one another. We're a church that strives to get along with each other. And we're a church that's about the community. But folks, if you've never experienced the grace of Jesus Christ, joining a church does you no good. You first must come to a place that you say, God, I am a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. And you come this morning and you let the world know, I want Jesus. I want Jesus. Father, this morning... We thank you for the people in this room. My family thanks you, God, for the many prayers that have been put up on our behalf. Father, we are amazed at the, not at your faithfulness, God, because you are so faithful, but God, at the faithfulness of this church towards us. Such amazing and beautiful people. Lord, today, today, May you add to your church. May you add to this congregation. May we be faithful to you above all things. We pray this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Let's stand together. In the morning when I rise in the morning when I rise in the morning, when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me
I pray you're able to say it's been a good day to be in the Lord's house. And uh, this young man has uh, wrestled with a number of these things for a lot of years. And this, while he was at camp uh, this summer, uh, he truly felt the Lord calling him to a place of salvation. So if you'll come up here, and I think I got him here. So uh, Westy, as most of us know him, is it just Westy or is it Weston? Give us the whole name, buddy. Weston. The whole name. Weston Grushley. The whole name. You don't have a middle name? Oh, Weston Lane Grushley. Thank you. <laughs> Weston Lane Grosky. And if you don't know how to spell it, we will have a spelling bee right after church. This young man, we've talked a couple of times, but I'm so thankful to know that he has come. He, he walked right up to me this morning and said, listen, I have accepted Christ. I, I know that, and I'm ready to be baptized. And uh, so I'm so thankful. If you would be willing to welcome this young man for baptism, as a candidate for baptism, would you say amen? Amen. And we are so excited for him and pray for him and his family as he grows and in his faith. And we're seeing a lot of these young people coming to know Christ. And it's an absolute amazing blessing for us. And I'm so thankful for you guys and just praying that uh, God will continue to lead and guide them. He's going to be right outside that door. You can come by and, and I'm going to be honest with you all. He loves his little cheeks pinched just like this. <laughs> and... And then he wants a little kiss from the ladies right here on the forehead, okay? <laughs> yes, he does. I'm telling y'all. He can shake his head all he wants to, but all right. Well, I'm so thankful for him and for his family, and we're just going to continue to pray for, uh, for him as he grows in Christ. Um, so many things happening today. Don't forget, right after service, you are more than welcome to go next door and eat with us, fellowship with us, uh, all those good things. And uh, Mr. Tyler is fixing to make an announcement about that. If you would like your car washed and you trust teenagers to wash your very expensive car, um, we have a drive through lane behind this fellowship hall in, in front of the youth building. There will be chalk lines and people directing you. So if you trust them to wash your car as well, uh, they'll be out there as well. Perfect. So while you're standing there, why don't you close us in a word of prayer? And Wesley and I are going to head that direction. Pray together. Father in heaven, we do thank you uh, for today and the opportunity to gather together as your church, as, as the people you, you've called called out to be saved, Father. Um, I pray that as we go out from this service, Father, that, that, God, we wouldn't just walk out and be dismissed, but, God, we'd walk out as, as sent people on mission, Father. God, I pray that uh, through the teaching of your word, God, you would e begin to equip our hearts to, to do exactly as Tom has uh, preached this morning, God. And that's what we can take it out, take it, to, uh, take it out to Waller County and the state of Texas and to the ends of the earth, Father. God, we... We pray that you would bring us back here uh, next week, God, so we continue to grow, uh, grow in our love for you and our love for your word, Father. And we pray this in your name. Amen.